Bon après-midi et bienvenue à nouveau à la conférence sur les données 2022. Valoriser les données et leur interprétation pour survivre la population canadienne. Nous espérons que vous avez apprécié la première série de séances simultanées. I know I have some great takeaway notes from my first session this morning, and I hope you had uh, you know, equally great takeaways from the sessions that you were listening to. As a reminder, we're taking questions throughout this webcast interface. If you'd like to ask a question, please go to the top right-hand corner of your screen and click on the participate button and answer your question. We might not be able to get all to all of your questions, but we'll get to as many as we possibly can. Up next, I'll invite Teiki Sarantakis, president of the Canada School of Public Service to introduce our next guest, Melissa Hathaway, who will offer a keynote address on leveraging data as a competitive advantage and the role of the public sector. Over to you, Taiki. Merci beaucoup. Je dis au début que c'était 5000 uh, personnes inscrit, c'est presque 7000 maintenant. So we're climbing during the course of the day. I was joking ahead of the time, we're kind of a little bit like a virus, but hopefully we're a, a good virus. And I really think that, again, that speaks to the testament of you as public servants. This is an issue that you're hungry to learn more about. And that makes me very, very happy because data is, some people say data is the new uh, oil, I actually like to say that data in a connected world is our new oxygen. And if you don't know about oxygen, you're not going to have a great life. So thank you for, for taking the time to uh, take, thank, thank you for taking the time to carve a little block off to learn about something important. So today we are so, so pleased and happy uh, for the next hour to be in the presence of Melissa Hathaway. So Melissa is the president of Hathaway Global Strategies. She was uh, in kind of in cyberspace uh, before cyberspace was cool. She worked at the White House under two administrations, a Republican administration uh, and a Democratic administration, so kind of bipartisan. And she literally, truly, honestly, is one of the world's foremost authorities uh, on cyberspace. And if you want to learn a little bit about cyber, um, go to our website, and a few months ago, we had a, a great, great chat between Melissa and our very own Scott Jones uh, when he was part of, or when he was the head of the Canadian uh, Cybersecurity uh, Office, and now he's on to bigger and better things. Um, in addition to all the great stuff that Melissa does, uh, I'm personally very grateful to Melissa for the following. She is a friend of Canada's public service. Every single time uh, we call her, she makes herself available. Uh, every single time she says something interesting and insightful. And uh, what else can you ask? Uh, so today, Melissa is joining us from the wilds of New Jersey. So through the magic of, of the internet, uh, we're all in different places, mm -hmm. and uh, as are you. So Melissa, I'm going to start with a big lob, bob, lob ball question, nice and simple. Don't mess it up, because if you mess up the opening lob, it'll, it'll just go south from there. But the reason why I want to ask you a big, simple question isn't because we don't know the answer, isn't because you don't know the answer, but I'm really curious to see how you would define the issue. And here it comes. So, Melissa, what what is data, and why do at least 6,900 of us care about it at this point in time? Well, Taiki, it's great to be here with you, albeit virtually. I can't wait to cross the border again um, and look forward to seeing everybody in person. And um, it's a great question. You know, so uh, data has, I think, has taken on a whole new life in its definition over the last several years or maybe the last decade. It's facts, it's figures, it's measurements, it's statistics, it's um, numbers. And it's, it's, it becomes information where you can create inferences um, or draw uh, understandings and um, and then help make decisions. And so when I think about 
there are a lot of inputs and data being created, whether it's an email that you send to me asking me to participate in this meeting, or um, it's data that's coming from all of our cell phones or any IP device that's actually tracking us geographically or where we're moving from and can uh, pinpoint us so that we can receive our uh, cell phone call. It is um, the Google search that you do on the internet that's actually tracking what websites you might have visited, what you might be clicking on for information for news, the latest news in, you know, from the, the Ukrainian invasion, um, or the click things that you're thinking about buying. And, um, and that profiling starts to begin because the inferences are saying, well, Melissa is reading the Globe and Mail because she wants to see the Canadian point of view of what's happening. Or Melissa is searching for you know, some, uh, some cleaning products. Maybe she would like something else for this uh, to go with that cleaning product. People who bought this also bought this or looked at this. And then I think what's most important is, is that we have are embedding more and more inter internet connected devices into every part of our life. Every piece of that, whether it's uh, your cell phone, your smart TV, your smart refrigerator, um, your house that's on the smart grid, all of these things are creating data about you, your consumption habits, your travel habits, um, and, and the like. And they can also then create interesting trends and information that we can start to make better decisions of for government, public servants, of where we need to provide services, how we need to repair or build new roads, how we need to... Um, you know, why we're going to collect more taxes from a certain area. And, um, and these are some of the things that I look at from a, a data perspective. And as we're going into the internet of things and the industrial internet of things, and we're connecting a new device every second to the internet, there's a lot of data out there that can be harvested and, um, and created inferences and make decisions. There's also a lot of data out there that we're not protecting. And that's why we need to talk about cybersecurity when we're talking about about this data and the new economy. Absolutely, Melissa. And uh, you're, you'll be pleased to know that you didn't flub the opening, which is great. And <laughs> for the and it's rest- It's gotta be a hockey, gotta be hockey, not softball or baseball, uh, come on. Yeah. But for the rest of kind of our time together, I'm actually gonna just pick your words and ask you to keep going. Okay. So you talked about data, you talked about kind of what we're, what we're kicking off. We're basically, at this point, we're basically data exhaust machines aren't mm -hmm. we like you mentioned like every time we listen to a piece of music every time uh, we order something every time we search something uh every time we watch a movie uh even just turning on your television the act of turning on your television mm -hmm. today even if you're not watching anything even just sitting in your car right if your car uh, isn't even turned on yet if you have a certain kind of car. We're giving off data. We're giving off a constant stream of data. And so I want to start, one of the first words I circled when you were talking or wrote down when you were talking was tracking. So tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about tracking. So I, I think that tracking is, is important um, because, you know, this is where um, companies like Google or um, are are monetizing the data that they're collecting on us. Um, and, you know, there's a famous um, project that they have up in Canada. I think it's been recently shut down, but Sidewalk Labs that was basically there so that they can track you based on your cell phone and, you know, the repeater stations through the, you know, this smart city. And they would be able to collect all of this and profile us. Um, so uh, track trace um, and predict what we're going to do next or what needs to be done. Um, and uh, and um, I think that that is uh, what some of our colleagues would say is it's leading to a potentially a surveillance state. 
Um, and I know from a, you know, from our, every IP device is a geolocation tracking device. So the more, the more devices that you have on you, right? I have my cell phone. I'm, t I'm talking to you through my computer. I have at least three or four other connected devices with me. All of those are putting out data that's saying, oh, Melissa uses an iPhone and Melissa's got a MacBook Pro and Melissa's at her parents' house on Verizon and Melissa's all these different things. Well, Melissa doesn't normally work in New Jersey. So what's going on? You know, and then you get like you get this profiling that happens. And I agree with you. It's data exhaust. We have more and more exhaust coming from all of these devices in our lives. And we need to be thinking about you said it's the oxygen. Some people say it's the oil. Uh, the, there's a lot of exhaust out there and it could be soon seen as pollution. And that's why we need to th start thinking about data, how long we're going to retain data, when, how, how, and when, when do we retire it? How do we retire it? Because it's all of this information that's out there that um, is very good for profiling. So the second thing that I wrote down that you said was, it was, it's not a word, unfortunately, it's two words. You said thinking about, uh, so they're, they're kind of gathering data uh, about things that we're thinking about. Why is that important? Well, it's getting to the predictive analytics and artificial intelligence is really what is driving. If I can um, make a, 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 a statistically relevant um, decision or a prediction based on, you know, Melissa's going to do this or whatever, then I'm spending less money actually on my services or I'm creating new efficiencies. Um, so if I, um, I can, I, I'm, I have to come up with a good example, but um, uh, again, this is how uh, Amazon is making its money, right? It's the predictive analytics. Melissa, you buying this book, you also might want to consider this book. So then I get, I'm get this clickbait, but I buy it and I actually like it. So then I give a good review and then somebody else does the same thing. Or again, the products, and that's how Amazon is, is, is monetizing it. And Facebook monetizes it very differently. It's sort of the friends and family. And that if you don't keep these things private, then what they do is they take and they do the data mining of all of these different things. And then they start to share that with your broader set of network. And it's it's the what I would call the one degree or the, the, the network effect. And that's how they're monetizing it. Now I'm using corporate examples uh, because government is supposed to be doing it for providing more effective uh, citizen services, for delivering more, um, for better in, or whatever, in, new infrastructures to our citizens who live in, in either very, very urban or rural territories, right? And being predictive about when is a, you know, when is a something um, moving into being more urban, right? So then I got to invest more in roads or into public services in those particular areas. Um, and uh and you start to see how other governments are using it right now um, more effectively than anybody in the West of uh, basically for the pandemic, right? And I'm, I'm tracking and tracing you by your cell phone for and determining by your cell phone how many people you were exposed to so that I can then you know, tell you you've been exposed to somebody, you have to quarantine, and I'm monitoring it by your IP devices to try to ensure for public health and safety. That was a long answer. Maybe I should give shorter answers. No, you just it's just a joy to listen to you. So let's let's stay on predictive analytics for a minute. So in a way, governments have kind of almost always done predictive analytics, right? Like we would do a census every four or five years, and we still do them. We would do surveying and we would kind of say, you know, the population's getting, it's growing. So we're going to need more schools or the population's getting older. We're going to need more hospitals or, you know, we're going to need a third university in this area, or we're going to close this daycare center and open up, you know, an elder care facility. So we've kind of always been doing that. But the big difference now, I think there's two big differences going on. Uh, well, there's a lot more, but I, I want to maybe talk about two of them. The first is private companies are now doing this, uh, and they're doing it better than us, by the way. Right. And then number two is that government in most areas 
doesn't have access to real-time information that private sector companies have. Maybe kind of give us a few thoughts in that area. So let me, I think that when we started to get to more of that real-time information, um, that that was really, I think one of the, one of the countries that was a leader in that and getting to predictive analytics, which is was the UK, and um, and they did it for counterterrorism, right? We had IRA bombings, et cetera. So they got to more of the, um, you know, the surveillance in the streets, the surveillance in the taxi cabs, and got to that predictive analytics of when they thought that there was going to be an event and everything. And I think that really was. That was a long time ago, but that was the first of sort of that real time information to prevent something from happening. And that kicked off, actually, I think the the algorithms and the predictive analytics that then got reassimilated back into the private sector because they started to see different ways they could monetize the information or the data. And, you know, like Facebook or Google or, you know, NSO group or anybody, right? And they all have found different ways to um, monetize the, the the algorithms and for whatever for whatever system they're in. Financial institutions, it's for real-time fraud detection detection, right? That somebody stole my credit card and that's Melissa we know is in New Jersey. So it can't possibly be used right in Virginia where she lives. So we're going to put a hold, fraud hold on that. That is real-time information based on geolocation tracking of me, pattern of life that this is not normal and that they know that I'm someplace else. So stop the credit card. Financial institutions are doing a great job with that predictive analytics and those AI, real-time information sharing. For governments right now, I think that real-time information it's still surveillance based. It's 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 the video feeding into the algorithms, and I think that that you see that right now also with the information sharing that's going on around re- the Ukraine um, crisis. Is that there's real time information that we have troop movements, but we're used to doing that. We've been doing that for fifty years. That type of surveillance. Now you have an online surveillance based on your data exhaust, and it's coming together of these disparate pieces of data that are putting together a picture of you or your patterns of life that then gets monetized by the private sector. Yeah, and that's a really good point. I really like how you kind of introduced the London example or the UK example, because in um, in the security realm, we're far more advanced as governments than we are in kind of the, you know, the applying for an old age pension or applying for unemployment insurance realm. Uh, so we do have experience with this because uh, in interests kind of where the state has a real interest, it takes data seriously. It takes real time. Um, it takes real time feedback loops uh, seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a country, at least one, that's using predictive analytics now uh, in terms of providing public services, uh, and that's Estonia. Mm-hmm. And I was wondering, do you know about Estonia? Or I know you know about Estonia, but can you speak about like the the predictive analytics parts of starting to use data for public service provision uh, and kind of flipping the paradigm a little bit to be instead of using it to monetize things we're using data now to serve citizens right so i'm not a deep expert on the specifics of how um estonia is doing that but what estonia did is that they have um you know they call themselves e estonia right so they've got everything online they have a they have a small population, right? So it's, you know, one and a half million people, right? So we're, um, so it's easy to conduct experiments when you're having, you have a, a, what I would call a small group or a small set of numbers. And what they've given is everybody is, everybody's got a national identity and cryptographic card that allows them to uh, do financial transactions, pay their taxes, um, you know, buy a house, uh, go to the supermarket, and it's all tied to this one cryptographic national identity card, which gives you a K, a, K, a constant in the equation. So I can now start to track what's going on, and I can start to provide more efficient or more um, or more robust services to my citizens. And the E Estonia is a model for a lot of countries to, um, you know, how do you how do you get it right and how do you get it wrong? Because they also had a problem with the cryptographic card, the math got hacked. 
And so they had to replace all of the cards and it delayed the national election um, there. And so there's an upside and a downside. You got to get the math right. And um, and uh, but uh, but they have been an example. And, you know, as I um, in Europe other parts of Europe, you start to see France talking a lot about um, AI and public service and, you know, how we want to make sure that the algorithm doesn't introduce bias so that I, because uh, the algorithm is now going to make the decision whether or not you get the healthcare benefit or whether you're eligible for parole or for retirement or these other things. And they want to make sure that there's no bias brought into the math. Um, and so they're making it very difficult to bring in these predictive analytics or the artificial intelligence into key things things, how you get a job, how you get a benefit, um, and those things. And I think those are important uh, ethical standards that we need to have because there's always a human behind the math and Absolutely. all humans have bias. And this question of, can you, can you uncode the bias out of you, what, how you, how you coded it? Now you've used the big word a couple of times. You use the word algorithm. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I was, you know, in grade six and grade seven, we learned about algorithms and i never thought that you know for the rest of my life you know in my 50s that algorithms were becoming more and more important not less and less important what kind of what is an algorithm a little bit because we talk about data mm -hmm. and we talk about algorithms but maybe talk to us a little bit about the relationship between the two well you have to translate the data into uh, something that you can make sense of and sentence interpret, you know, and, um, and that usually when um, this is where, you know, if, if anybody's working with complex databases, this is, you know, the, the basis of SQL, X plus X and Y helps you get to Z. And, um, and so it's really the math, the, the math of coding all of these different data sets into something that helps you make a decision, makes sense out of it. That's the algorithm. It's math. It's a math equation. And, um, and, you know, if I think that a variable X is more important than Y, that was me, my personal decision as the mathematician behind the algorithm and I introduced potentially bias because I decided that one variable was more important than another. Could it be geography? It could be gender. It could be race. It could be any sorts of where, you know, where it could be anything. And those are the, and so um, when you're talking about predictive analytics or you're talking about artificial intelligence, or you're talking about e-Estonia, it's all underpinned by math, maths and, um, that is making sense of the data and and that's always got a person behind it and that's why there's been so much concern that we might be introducing um bias into some of this decision making inadvertently it's not deliberate but although there could be countries that are doing it deliberately um and because it's uh it's a means to help ensure the authoritative you know authoritarian state or state control over certain things and it could be though that the data not necessarily is biased because the data is kind of like a reflection of the past because in, in one way that's kind of what data is and in, in some important ways but it could be that the data if you're just relying on the data looking in the rear view mirror that could also introduce bias correct yeah it, it can because then you're not thinking about the over the horizon opportunity or issues right you're not anticipating the next set of data that could actually inform the last set of data right and that's um and you're starting to see some of that experimentation like with the the, the driverless cars tesla um you know they're having to look over the horizon to the next set of data you know in order to make sure that you have a safe uh, journey on the road um based on past data on you know testing the cars and you know in what I would call sterile environments. And now when they get into non-sterile environments, they're really on the road and, you know, there's a hurricane or there's a sandstorm or there's a snowstorm, it confuses the way the math was generated because it's not a sterile environment anymore. That's future data. That's over the horizon sensory information that has to inform the decision of the, of, for this, the car. Yeah. But there's also even kind of a bit more, uh, familiar biases that could creep in like there's that there's there's a few times where uh, people have kind of pointed an algorithm at a bunch of data and said tell me over the last 30 years who my best astrophysicists have been so I can keep hiring 
the best astrophysicists. And if you kind of look back and you go, well, you know, your, your ideal astrophysicist looks like this, is mm -hmm. educated here, uh, is a man or is a woman or is whatever, uh, then it becomes uh, kind of self-reinforcing. Right? right, right. There's a really interesting, um, I think it's the AI Institute in New York. Um, it's at NYU. Uh, and they have an international team. Actually, it's funny because most of the people there are from Australia. And they've been doing data sets on uh, an analysis, like uh, case studies. And one of the case studies they did was um, for hiring, just like as you said, um, it was, uh, I'm, I th I'm pretty sure it was Amazon. Amazon had looked at who are their top execs over the last 20 years and had created, you know, this is the HR profile that we want to have. Well, um, most of the top execs were all men and they were white men. And so the algorithm, when you go to monster.com or you're uploading your, your resume, it actually automatically threw out any female candidates because the female names were thrown out because there was no female names in that in that so they you know they fixed it only after the light or trans it may was made transparent how there was this bias in the way that they had done their algorithms or that historical data um, and I think that's important we have to we have to make sure that when we choose the this was the ideal or the dream team well that may not have been multicultural it may not have been geographically diverse it may not have been gender diverse so all of these different things that um, the past may not be representative of what we want for the future. Absolutely, because then there, there becomes, I guess, the possibility of freezing the past mm -hmm. and, and perpetuating the past uh, into the future. One of the things that I like to talk about to public servants is this notion of algorithmic government, that we are now almost on the precipice of things that are done by human beings very soon will start being more and more done by algorithms. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if you're applying for unemployment insurance or you're applying for uh, a pension or you're applying for a permit, there's a human being that kind of looks at the rules, yep. which is maybe the algorithm, and looks at kind of the specifics of what you're applying for, you know, oh, you're 52, you can't apply for a pension. Uh, oh, you live in this area, your unemployment is too low to get unemployment insurance without waiting for a month or what have you. Let's call that the data. And then those two things together become the decision. Right. So we are, if we're not there soon, I would be surprised, but we're moving more and more towards algorithmic government, uh, especially in the provision of services, because really these are, as I said, you know, a, a formula, which is the algorithm and some facts, which is the data, and yep. you marry those two things together. What are some of the things we should be grateful for or worried about as we start moving into kind of algorithmic government? Well, I think the first grateful for is it should lead to a, f a faster decision time, right? It's going, it's going to save time. Therefore, it saves resources in theory, right? But it should deliver citizen services faster. It should, I apply today, it goes through the computer, spits out tomorrow. Yep, Melissa's qualified for the benefit. You know, Melissa can cross the border, whatever, right? These different things. Um, so I think it's 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 the efficiency or the time as one of the key metrics and and most likely money as one of the key metrics right and it should it should eliminate some of the fraud should eliminate some of the fraud um that I think is to be determined uh the things that we should be worried about again is 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 kind of what France has been talking about I think also the Toronto um accord talked about it is that we're Again, this is now a computer or it's math that's making a decision, and there could be an advertent bias there, and it could make a wrong decision, right, and, and deny somebody the benefits. So then what is going to be the appeals process? That can't be a computer also, right, or an algorithm that makes the appeal. It's got to be something more broad than that, you know, or a person's got to, you know, and there has to, we have to think through the adjudication and governance process around that. We also need to think about, are there certain things that, that we don't want it to be an algorithm making the decision? 
um, and that it still has to have a person in the loop. Those are that's, that's and we should have we should be very thoughtful about those things. Um, and then the governance around uh, around it, because um, you want you know we're democratic countries. We want to have the transparency. We believe in rule of law, and this is you know as, as we start to make these changes, and we're um, again for time and money that we don't we don't want to lose the transparency and fairness of society. Um, and I think those are the questions we should be asking. Now, the last big thing that I had circled uh, here that I wrote down uh, from your opening remarks that I want to touch on is the IoT, the Internet of Things. Um, and before we kind of get into the IoT, I've heard you before give kind of a little bit of a wonderful little history of the Internet in a couple of minutes, kind of like where it started, what the goal was, how it was supposed to be used. Uh, and then that'll, I think, lead us nicely into the IoT discussion. So right. maybe give us a little bit of a history of this thing that we call the internet today. Sure, sure. So the internet started as a military project in the United States in October of 1969 was the first successful transmission of data over in the internet um, and between universities in California. And so that was the that was it, the beginning of the internet. And it was still designed for assured communications. So command and control of the military uh, as secondary communications channel, not over the plain old telephone system, right? Which is actually kind of funny. Um, and um, in a time of a of a either a nuclear crisis, disaster, it was supposed to be a secondary form of comms. So um, by 1972, you had the internet um, again through military uh, mill to mill cooperation and through an education um, consortium through like National Science Foundation and the equivalent of many countries. We had successfully had internet transmissions to Europe and over to Japan, and so you now had a European. Transatlantic, and you had a Trans-Pacific um, uh, communications uh, line. Uh, there were a lot of uh, things in the 1970s, deregulation of telecommunications, the advancement of microelectronics. So by 1980, you had your first real computer. It was a suitcase. If you guys, if anybody remembers those, I had one of those IBM computers. And I had so we, a Commodore PET. Yeah. So we had mobility, mobile computers now with an internet. That was a huge advancement then, uh, you know, by 1980, right? And they had the, the 8086 chip, the Intel chip behind it, right? So you kind of think about the semiconductor wars that we're in today. Those were had it had its birthplace in the in the in the 19, late 1970s, around 1980. In 1985 was the seminal year for the internet and what it means to us today. And because that was when we opened up the dot com domain. And that, you said 85 or 95? 85. 85. 85. And um, and so 1985 is when we opened the dot com domain. It was an experiment in, in for commerce, and of at the time we only we didn't think it was going to be a big commercial. This what it has become today. We only allowed 15 one five percent of the address space for dot com. Then there was another set of relaxation, export control relaxation to allow for commerce and to enable trusted transactions on the internet. And um, you also had your first uh, major theft of uh, at the, on the in the bank system in 1986. So you started to see the necessity for having encrypted communications, encrypted transactions, to have trusted transactions on the internet. Then the next major innovation was 1990 out of Switzerland, out of CERN, and we got the World Wide Web. So you could click, connect, and search any information all around the world. And that was then now libraries started to upload information. It led to the birth of you know Wikipedia and all of these different things around the year 2000. Also around the year 2000, right, from 1990 to 2000, we started to connect all of our critical infrastructures to the internet for efficiency, cost, right, all these cost savings that would allow us to uh, reduce some of our infrastructure per footprint. And that was when um, we had the very, you know, the year 2000, the Y2K bug. We so, also I'm just going to pause you here. You don't mean computer infrastructure. You mean like 
nuclear power plants you mean like water, water treatment plants, water treatment electric power pipelines, pipelines yeah. all of those things so that was the critical infrastructure so we finally had y2k was like okay oh my gosh we've coded this all for two years not four years so we might have a computer meltdown because it doesn't know what to do with the zero zero over again and we were really worried about critical infrastructures going offline and so i worked y2k floors i'm sure you did and a lot of people you know who are listening to us um, and uh, through a whole lot of, in, of investment by all of our countries to recode everything, we made it through without, without a lot of problems. But then we started to talk about, oh my gosh, we need critical infrastructure protection. And it kicked off a whole, you know, I would argue now since 2000 to today, we're still talking about critical infrastructure protection or critical infrastructure resilience, which we don't have anywhere because we've connected everything to the internet. And we don't have a plain old telephone system anymore. The telephone system is also an IP network. It's running over the internet. So we've, we've actually bled resiliency out. We don't have a redundant or a new platform that we could fall back to. And, um, and therefore, it's made us a lot more vulnerable um, and, uh, and the like. So I could go further into our history, but so, I'll stop there. But I, I'm going to do like my grade two summation because my brain isn't as big as yours, even though my head is much bigger than yours from what I can see in front of me. But the uh, basically, we had this thing, a uh, bunch of wires. We started connecting computers to each other all around the world, very decentralized, not a lot of kind of top down, thou shalt, thou shalt not, uh, kind of cheap, get it, get connections, get everything done. And then we started seeing the utility of this thing. We started seeing the utility of connection. And then people, not surprisingly, started connecting. Right. And as we started connecting, one of the things we forgot about was we're migrating these important things onto this, let's call it a platform. We're yeah. migrating all of these important things onto a platform. Uh, but you know, we're kind of migrating them into an area where we would have never kind of, you know, opened a, a water treatment plant without having a lock. We would have never opened a, uh, you know, a wastewater treatment plant without having giving somebody a key. Right. So did we make a big mistake? Well, I, I think we were not thoughtful on um, it's, it's, I'll start with the, safety of measures around these decisions, because I think it's a safety issue now. We didn't think through the resilience of these infrastructures, because they're now almost all have a single point of failure, the internet, or a single point of entry, the internet. And, um, and I think it's going to get worse with the internet of things and the industrial internet of things. And then we didn't think about security. Now, a lot of people think about, we should have said security first, but in a lot of other parts of our critical infrastructures, it's really about citizen safety um, and it's safety first. And if you get to safety and res safety would have built it the security and resilience, most likely would have brought in some of these aspects of how we think about the metrics and then resilience. We need to have continuity of government. We need to have business continuity. I have to ensure I have, you know, water power, telecom and infrastructures that my citizens have been used to for well over a hundred years. Right. You know, and it's sort of like, okay, and now, now it's possible they won't have those services because of the way that we've architected it. Um, and so, um, so we, it will take us, we've, uh, bought into this for, more than two decades, right? So if you just even 2000, 22 years or 25 years, we it will take us 20 to 25 years to buy down that risk and to, to do the risk reduction measures and put in safety controls and resilience measures. And that will make us, you know, it'll give us, I think, new opportunities and, and it'll give us security by definition, but it will, it's going to have to be thoughtful and, yeah. and dedicated and not just a one term president or, you know, prime minister or, and, or, you know, and the deputy ministers that you have, it's going to have to be a continuity of government of a 25 year plan to undo what we've done over the last, you know, for efficiencies, for modernization, for these things. And, and we should learn from our mistakes because as we move to the internet of things and the industrial internet of things and things like edge compute and your car is computing to get 
for your car, my car is computing for your car for, for safety on the highway. It has a whole new meaning for data and data protection and data privacy and how we have data governance rules and in order to enable safety, resilience, you know, and, and, and modernization or trans digital transformation of our societies. Yeah, and I love that distinction you make between safety and security because I think it's one that we don't make often enough because I think if we talked more in terms of safety than security, which is what we do do, which is security, I think more of us would just kind of get it intuitively that this is, oh, this is kind of, you know, this is important to me. This is right. where kind of you think about security as almost somebody else's responsibility. Yeah, and it, this... This really got hammered home to me when I worked at Transport Canada. Right. They had a division called safety and a division called security. And I was kind of like, well, what's the difference? And it was like, well, safety means the plane's not going to fall out of the sky. Security means the plane's not going to fall out of the sky because a bad person did it. Right. And so like there's, you know, you still get to the point where the plane's not falling out of the sky, but you think about it differently. If, yeah. it's, if it's a safety issue, versus a security issue so yeah. that's kind of oh do you want to say something yeah i just i think the nuclear industry has always been trained for safety yeah you know water also always safety right you know we put we put um chlorine in the water to make our teeth stronger or you know to kill the bugs and stuff like that so you know it's like we have to be thinking about it that that in the future because it's it's going to be it's, we are in the middle of a digital transformation where it's touching everything in our lives so we yeah. really need to think about that safety first so that's the history of the internet 101 um, now we're about to move into the iot which is kind of another phase of the internet but before we do the iot um what percentage of our kind of our economy right now is online, Melissa. Grosso modo, I know it varies by the minute, by the day, by the country, but roughly, what percentage of our economy is online? Roughly, I, I would say it's a, a global economy. It's between 15 and 20 percent. Um, for Canada and the United States, it's it's between eight and ten. Maybe we're a little we're a little we're behind Northern Europe for sure, or in, in Estonia. So we're um, more analog yeah. than other. Oh, that by, can't be surprising. By a factor of half. <laughs> yes. Yes, according to our Bureau of Statistics and your Bureau of Statistics. All yeah. right. So public policy wonks out there kind of swallow hard at that one. We're about. 50% uh, less digital than some of our uh, fellow planetary inhabitants. So about, you know, 15% or in Canada and the United States, 10% of the economy is online. So that's obviously very, very important to protect uh, online for the purposes of the economy, because we know that online economy is growing. I think I've read anywhere between seven and 12 times the rate of the non-online economy. Right. So, you know, if we were to have this conversation a couple of years from now, everybody would be much, much higher. But now we've got this thing called Internet of Things where we're not just kind of putting the economy online, we're putting our toasters online, we're putting our garage door openers, we're putting our pacemakers, we're putting almost anything you can think about online. So maybe talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, so the Internet of Things, we're connecting 120 some odd devices every second to the Internet. Um, and we're doing it for, you know, different different reasons, largely to gather this data to um, in, create new efficiencies so I can, you know, save money, save time. And um, so I'll just give you a couple of examples in the agriculture is one of the leading sectors that is embedding the Internet of Things into it, agriculture and livestock. So from an agriculture perspective, I can put an IP device and multiple in my fields 
and I can determine whether or not they they need water or fertilizer, how, how what my crop yield is going to be based on the data that those devices in the agriculture are putting out. And I can be then, again, predictive. I'm going to have a better yield this year because of the following conditions, the, the facts and the numbers. Um, I'm also putting IP devices on my cattle or sheep or pigs, right, hogs. Um, and I'm selling this as farm to table. I can tell you the supply chain of that from the, the birth to where it grazed, what water holes it was in, and then to slaughter, to table of the whole supply chain of the of the livestock. And that's a it's a it's an it's a competitive enhancing thing, right? Because I might pay more if you can prove the provenance of all of that. And it saves me if I'm the company like a Tyson or you know, I can actually say, I need to recall X number of chickens or, you know, th this, pro this poultry that hit the market, because I know that that water source or that food source was contaminated and it allows for a faster product recall. So that, that would be one vertical that's using it. Another vertical that's using it um, differently around the world is, um, is uh, transportation. And, um, and so I have, all of our cars have IP devices in them. And uh, when, so when you're driving on uh, the highway, depending upon which country you're in, it will it'll um, track you from waypoint to waypoint and toll roads here in the United States. But in, in like the UK, it's it's the really monitoring speed. So if you get to waypoint A and then to go waypoint B and they know that you got there too fast based on you will get an automatic ticket in the in the mail. Um, and and so that's interesting. And that's happening in Hong Kong, UK and elsewhere. Germany, they're using it, those IP devices to not only understand um, traffic patterns, but also to prioritize road repair um, and where the investments need to be and um, or how to adjust traffic signals, et cetera, to keep traffic flowing. Uh, so that's a, a and, um, and from a, a, another sort of transportation, they're using IP devices on, on big cargo to track important shipments and uh, make sure they're not, you know, uh, stolen or manipulated or whatever. And that's, you know, for the big um, the big container boxes and stuff that are on our big ships and, and or that then go on the road. Those would be a few examples. I could give one for pretty much any vertical, uh, but those would be examples of how IP or the Internet of Things is actually touching every part of our life now and how it's going to expand. Absolutely. It sounded, as you were talking, it sounded a little bit analogous to what you were saying earlier about Amazon and the, oh, you bought this book, you might want to try this book here, click here. The Internet of Things also, you know, through the traffic examples that you gave, it's also kind of a little bit about our behavior. It's kind mm -hmm. of making us say, you know, you, you want to speed? Okay, it's going to cost you. Um, don't take this road, take this other road, because I have right. real-time data that says that's jammed. Um, one of the books back there has this very provocative title and it's written by one of your colleagues who lectures at Harvard with you. Uh, and it's called Click Here to, to Kill Everyone. <laughs> um, is that Peter, Peter Singer? Who is that? Which one was it? Who is that? Uh, I think it was Bruce. Bruce Meyer? Uh, yeah, Bruce Meyer. Bruce okay. Meyer. Click, click Here to Kill Everyone. Talk, talk to us a little bit about that. Well, um, so, well, Bruce's premise, and I agree with him, is that, again, we're fielding all of these devices quickly. They're poorly engineered. They're very vulnerable. And um, and so, uh, so it, you know, I can, um, this is where it's algorithmic warfare. If I can identify X number of very, you know, vulnerable devices, and I click there, I could really actually probably I could either, I could destroy all those devices or I could lock them up and make them not work. So one of the biggest you know examples of that was in 2017 when we saw um, Russia launch a, a wiper virus called NotPetya against an accounting company in Ukraine, but it was really against um, Microsoft operating system and they wiped it just it just wiped Active Directory it wiped 
all of these, a lot of computers and everything, and it went all around the world affecting, you know, just every sector, you know, rail went down in Spain, uh, Merck, you know, we had pharmaceutical companies going down here in the United States, almost all the transportation and logistics companies went down from FedEx to DHL, et cetera. And it, it shows that you can click one click and you can you can take out a lot and that should really worry us that yeah. we have that much an, an unstable amount of vulnerability a strategic vulnerability in the core of all of our critical infrastructures and let's bring that kind of to to a more personal realm if you or i or anybody in the audience has a connected home and kind of mm-hmm. all of our stuff is online whether it's our toaster uh, our garage door opener uh, our light bulbs, and we bought a light bulb six years ago, and it's it was state of the art back then. But the manufacturer went uh, bankrupt, and it's a smart light bulb, and it's connected to my Wi-Fi, and it's connected to you know everything else. Can somebody get into kind of my life vis-a-vis that unprotected light bulb? For sure, um, absolutely. There's a there is a software program that's for free on the internet called Showdown.io, and well, I don't can... tell them how to get it. Oh but... yeah, well, I, it's <laughs> it's good that informed people who are trying to protect our countries should know just as much as the informed people who are trying to harm our countries. So Showdown.io. Remember, if you go there, go there for good. Keep yeah, go there for good. You can yeah. so, go see how vulnerable you are, yeah. and um, and it'll show you. These are how many um, uh, 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 unpatched devices that you've got running, and here are the pathways into your home or to your business or to your government institution, and um, that can change on a daily or hourly basis depending upon what's going on. And uh, yeah, and uh, I use this all the time. I'm I'm not one of those people who loves the connectivity. I would never buy a smart TV. There's a lot of things I would not buy anymore. I'll be analog um, or I won't use it um, because I don't want to have my TV to be able to be turned on remotely to listen to the conversation in my room or, you know, your Alexa or your Google Assist. All of these things that we're putting into our lives to make our lives more efficient or I don't know. Um, we we think that it's improving our lives. There's also a lot of things that are coming in that could allow somebody to have access into what you would have considered private, um, or you would have locked your door. You need to lock your internet, like you lock your door um, or lock your car. Yeah. For me, my my kind of sanctuary since I was 16 was my car, and my car is now getting to the point where you know it's time to buy the new car. And I really am kind of swallowing hard exactly for the reasons that you say, which is like my sanctuary will now become like a monitoring machine. Right. Uh, my car will have a digital twin. Uh, my car, people will know how many kilometers I've driven, when, where, just sitting in my car thinking before I pick up my daughter, uh, somebody will be trying to get data from me. Right. Uh, and, and, it, and your car might actually tell you you're not a good driver and auto correct you. And well, that's exactly. Like, right. No, and that's absolutely. terrifying because the computer does not exactly know that that's a black ice up there, which is why I'm veering out of my lane. Right. They don't, no, no. Just, we're not, we're not there yet with the algorithms. And so, you know, the autocorrect and these other things is scary what's going on. Yeah. So that leads us actually into a wonderful question from the audience and uh, bang on point. And so I'll just read it verbatim. Could you talk to us about how data privacy, uh, for instance, what legislations give big companies like Google, Facebook, and Amazon the right to collect our data? And obviously, you don't have to talk about the Canadian context, but tell us kind of maybe why do these companies take maybe what I would call our data and make it their data? Yeah, so um, the challenge that we have, um, certainly here in North America in particular, is, is that we really love the free service. We love the Gmail, the free Gmail. We love the... You know, these are the they're all free. And so you if if the service is free, then you are the product. 
and um, they have to monetize it somehow, right? And so when you agree to that service level agreement or you agree to download and use Gmail or Google's cloud or these other things, you have also technically agreed to give over all your data and allow them to data mine or profile it. And that is allows them to monetize your data in order to pay for the free service you obtain. Now, I would argue they're making a lot more money than the service that you're getting, but we like to get something free, but there's no such thing as a free lunch. You are the product and your data is the, how they're going to monetize it um, and profile and those other things. The same with Facebook. That's how they sell their ads. Um, they're selling ads. That's how they're monetizing it because they're, they're selling these profiles that we've got this demographic. They're talking about these things. They sell ads to whatever Coca-Cola or I don't even know. And that's how, you know, they're, they're making their money is again, the data that they're collecting on us. So now how does this come into a data protection or data privacy regime? Well, right now you can observe there's some really important, um, rulings that are happening now in Europe around Schrems, which is um, legal court case and the, and the multiple under and the, um, the, uh, their, uh, the, the European Court of Justice. And um, it's saying that the collection and the analytics using this is against GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. And so there's been recent rulings against Google Analytics and a few other companies that they can't use this to profile European citizens. There's a, the California um, Consumer Protection Act uh, has also made a similar ruling that you cannot cr collect the geolocation data um, of people using platforms. And so to try to stop this profiling and other things. Um, and But the challenge that we have to the, to the person who asked the question is, is that we have a real problem now with uh, this multi-jurisdictional data protection, data privacy regimes, because a lot of countries look at this as, well, this is important for citizen privacy, but it's also, I'm going to make some of these rulings for my own competitiveness. And I'm going to force you, Americans or others, to store your data in Europe. Well, that means I have to build a data center, you know, hire Europeans. I got to keep it there. And it, and it starts to generate that ecosystem. You're seeing that in China. You're seeing it in a lot of places. The data protection and privacy regimes are off center. They're not, we're not aligned. So that's inhibiting cross-border data flows. It's becoming a trade barrier or a tax on our trade. It's making us inefficient. And it's actually putting us in conflict in some ways because we're like, wow, we have this transatlantic partnership or we have the, you know, the um you know, the North America, uh, uh, you know, uh, US, USMCA, right? Mexico, Canada, US, and, and we need to ensure these cross-border data flows in order to make North America strong in our trade partnership, which we have done. It has the gold standard of the data protection, but we don't have this any longer transatlantically. That's a problem. And it's a problem for our companies. It's a problem for us as governments that we have to start to get our head in the game around cross-border data flows, data protection, privacy, how data is actually actually enhancing our competitiveness or detracting from our competitiveness because our laws are either behind or our laws are impediments. And we need to be, we need to have a much thought, more thoughtful conversation of that across government and across, you know, industry. Yeah. And so um, what I hear from you, Melissa, actually gives me hope because I think what you're saying, one way of interpreting what you're saying is public policy is finally starting to get that this is an issue. And it's not just about the click here and sign away all your rights and click here and somebody else owns you. That's too much of a kind of a burden to put on users. That's too much of a kind of a, a, a transaction cost that shouldn't be associated with uh, the consumer, so to speak. Now, that's really something that kind of demands regulation which isn't a great word but it, it like it demands some kind of public policy intervention because these are issues as you say that impact on um on trade they impact on competitiveness they impact on quality of life it's kind of it would be the analog equivalent of buying 
you know, uh, a ticket to a movie theater and the, the movie theater says, you know, by buying this ticket, you agree to set yourself on fire. <laughs> we so want you to do. And um, it may be not a fair trade, so to speak. Like it's, you know, we have in the analog world, we have laws and regulations and procedures and practices to kind of make that stuff work. And one of the things that I think we should all kind of take away from here is even though a lot of us have kind of grown up with the internet and with data, that these are, they're in the long context of things, they're relatively new. Like it took a long time for public policy to figure out what to do with the telephone or mm -hmm. with the television or with the radio or with electricity. And these are things that are like, not only right up there with all of those, in, in many ways, they're more important than all of those. So it's kind of, in a way, it's not surprising that Europe, North America, Canada, you know, we're all kind of fumbling towards this right now. I think the important thing is that we keep fumbling because uh, through our fumbles, we will get to the right place one day. Melissa, I want to thank you so, so very much for spending another informative hour with Canada's public service. Uh, off the charts, as always, uh, I love talking to people who I learn from. And every single time I talk to you, I learn more. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Tom, I'm throwing it back to you. Thanks, Melissa. Thank Be you. Well. Have a great thank, day. Thank you, Taiki. Um, it's uh, it's too bad that I'm on the screen now because I didn't want this conversation to end. It, it was such a fascinating, thought-provoking, and riveting session. A huge thank you, Melissa and Taiki. We're, we're very grateful that you made the time to be with us today to share these uh, important and rich insights and to really kind of bring that that global perspective to our conference this afternoon. Merci beaucoup for that. That's That was fantastic. Nous allons maintenant prendre une pause santé dès votre retour à 14h30, heure de l'Est. Nous vous invitons à choisir votre prochaine session via VXPO. Please leave the VXPO page open at all times. This hub will allow you to navigate through the different portions of the conference. And there's also going to be, that's your, your portal and your way through to be able to uh, use GC Message uh, to access the partner kiosks, networking opportunities, and most importantly, uh, the conference sessions. The next breakout sessions will be followed by yet another health break, which means that we'll see you all back here at 3.50 p.m. Eastern time. Bonne pause, bonne session, et à plus tard. Merci.